Hello, and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Neil McFarland, and today we have with us Dr. James Kirby, former dean of the Perkins School of Theology, then interim president of the university, and now a very active professor of church history. Jim, it's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to, to chat with you. I joined the faculty here in the fall of 1954, and if my memory serves me correctly, you entered as a student in that same time period. I entered the seminary in the fall of 54. I actually started to SMU in the summer of 1951. Oh, did you really? Lived in Atkins Hall. Oh. And then transferred uh, when I decided that I wanted to come back to seminary here. Mm -hmm. But I came to seminary in the fall of 54 with you. Yes. Well, that was a very interesting time in the history of this uh, university. I was one of five new faculty members that fall. And I can't imagine a more exciting situation that I entered into. What are your recollections of that particular period and your assessments of how it impacted you? I've always felt very privileged to have been able to be in that part of the seminary's life and experience. It, uh, I think you're absolutely right, was a truly unique time in the life of the seminary. Uh, the staff was turning over almost uh, entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman Cunningham had come in here right. and all of us who had the privilege of knowing and working with him and <laughs> being chastised by him on occasions uh, knew what a wonderfully creative individual he was and he was transforming this in institution from a uh, he did, preacher yeah. boy school to yeah. a graduate professional school and the people who were coming here were exciting people mm -hmm. and interesting people. He had previously recruited Albert Outler who, who I'm sure served as a a beacon for bringing others others in, but uh, this was really a very exciting time in the life of the university, and Dean Cunningham also uh, had a real social conscience. You remember that uh, in 1954, this was the year of the Supreme Court decision outlawing, outlawing the segregation. He had already recruited a class of, I believe it was nine, uh, African-American students. And you and I were here in our first year and their senior year. That's right. Yes. That's right. There were five of them who were seniors that yes. year. Some of whom have gone on to be quite well known. Yes. <laughs> Cecil Williams in particular. Yeah. Well, how do, you, how do you assess that period in the life of the seminary as you, um, as you look back on it? John Deschner years ago, as you probably remember, said that uh, this was the first Perkins and he's mm -hmm. talked about the second Perkins and the third Perkins and the yeah. way in which the university changed in that period of time. But in that first period, I think the first thing that happened is that uh, academic standards were raised dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, these people who were coming in here were young and energetic and uh, many of them, like you, were veterans of the Second World War. They come out of a lot of them out of Yale, a lot of them out of Union in New York. They had had that experience together. Uh, I ran across a picture of the, of the faculty, which I judge to have been in the fall of 54. If it was not, it may have been in the fall of 55 yeah. because I could recognize, I knew everybody in the picture. And I was struck by uh, how, how much they were alike in some ways. They were about the same age, they mm -hmm. were male, they were all uh, young and energetic, and it was an exciting time. We all looked forward as students to, uh, to seeing who was coming in. One of the things, to tell you the truth, that I sometimes lament is that we are, uh, I think we're a little short on characters now. And in those <laughs> yeah. days, as you know, we had some we bona had some fide characters. <laughs> yeah, we, we did indeed. They you care to life. mention any of them? <laughs> well, certainly all of us would remember Joseph Wesley Matthews. Yeah, absolutely, um, yes. Uh, I remember that uh, taking a course with Joe Matthews and having to get there early in order to get a seat mm -hmm. because the undergraduates kept coming down from the campus to uh, sit in on the <laughs> class. And so you had to get there early to get a seat. He, he was a real showman, wasn't he? He certainly was. <laughs> yeah. He certainly was. And his partner in crime, Ed Hobbs. And right. 
they could, between the two of them, they certainly uh, could keep it lively. <laughs> they did indeed. <laughs> well, you and, and Patty, who later became your uh, wife, were in one of the first classes that I taught here at SMU, and I, I cherish that memory. <laughs> well, we do too. We took the history of religions, and, and as you know, Patty's, Patty is one of your greatest fans. She <laughs> often says to me, why, why can't teachers do what Neil McFarland did? Why make it clear and give us an outline and write those names on the board? So, well, those who are simple-minded do it in a simple-minded way. Well, I, I don't find it that simple-minded now that I've been doing it for years. I think it's pretty helpful as a matter of fact. So we enjoyed that. But it was an exciting time. And I guess the thing that, that sticks in my mind about it, it was, it was the first time because uh, I had come out of a conservative West Texas background, pretty limited in experiences, and it was my first time to, uh, to ever be admitted as a full participant to the academy. Mm -hmm. Students in those days, and of course you remember the coffee hour, oh, yes. we had the schedule in which we were all in lockstep, and then at 10 o'clock why we stopped, and uh, we had 30 minutes of chapel, and then we had this coffee hour, and the coffee hour was both where I developed a nasty habit of drinking coffee, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it was a place at which there was always a lively exchange. It was, it was indeed. And it was faculty yeah. and students and administrators all sort of yeah. gathered together. To all were available to each other. All available to each other, yeah. and I think and that, that was critical. That was a very powerful factor, yeah. Well, you finished here, I guess, finished the seminary in 1957? Yes, I finished in 57. I. Uh, had done enough hours to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, get a master's degree by writing a thesis, mm -hmm. and I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship to, uh, to go to uh, Cambridge, and so I spent the year 57-58 in Cambridge, uh -huh. in which I wrote that thesis, and then I got a master's degree in 59. Mm -hmm. So I graduated officially in 57 and 59. Mm -hmm. Well, then uh, you came back here as dean in 81, as I remember, but now that leaves about uh, 22, 24 years unexplained. Uh, uh, what, uh, what went on during that period? Well, interesting, uh, uh, some parts of it. I uh, went from Cambridge to Roby, Texas to become the pastor of the First Methodist Church in Roby. Uh, Roby in those days was not as famous as it is now, You and a lot of people know that the uh, Terry family and some of their cohorts won the lottery, won $47 million oh, and put Roby on the map. But, <laughs> That'll do it. But I got to Roby and there were two paved streets in the town. One the highway that went north and south, the other the highway that went east and west. And there was a great big sign out on the edge of town on both sides that said, Roby, the crossroads of opportunity. <laughs> and when I got back, why, uh, I was visiting the flock, you know, kind of get acquainted. And one of them said to me, well, son, you've, uh, you've been studying over across the pond, haven't you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I know you're glad to get back to civilization. <laughs> so to the crossroads of, of the world. To the crossroads <laughs> of opportunity. <laughs> uh, they were good to us and they were patient with us. And uh, I stayed in, uh, in Roby for a couple of years and I came back up here to Dallas and talked to Marilyn Cunningham, who had become a kind of mentor of mine. And uh, he said, you know, I think if, uh, if you ever think about going to graduate school, you've probably been out in Roby about as long as you need to be. <laughs> Why don't you just go on back to school? So I had wanted to do something related to Methodist studies, and David Shipley, who was yeah. one of your colleagues here, yes. and a great uh, influence on me and a very uh, Marvelous man. gentle, yeah human being. Uh, Shipley had said to me, you ought to go to Drew because they've got Franz Hillebrand and they've got some other folks who, uh, Will Herberg and people who are doing some interesting things, you ought to go up there. And uh, tell you the truth, I'd really thought I'd rather go to Yale, but uh, Shipley said go to Drew. So I applied to Drew and in the fall of 1960, I entered at Drew. And uh, I graduated from there in uh, in 63, I uh, didn't really think too much about it at the time, but since then I've discovered that may be my most notable achievement to go all the way through graduate school <laughs> in three years. 
But uh, <laughs> that is an achievement. <laughs> at any rate, uh, I did. And then um, I had two offers for you to teach, and one of them was to go back to McMurray College out in West Texas and uh, teach out there, and the other was to uh, uh, go into the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia and teach at a women's college called Sweetbriar. Yeah. And I went down to Sweetbriar and uh, never had seen anything quite like it. Certainly never had been around uh, a women's college. That, uh, that was a whole new experience. But something told me that was a better thing for me at the time than to go back out to the familiar tried and true places mm -hmm. in West Texas. So we went to Sweetbriar. And I must say, I had four truly marvelous and incredible years there. The sort of uh, Albert Outler of the Sweetbriar faculty was a historian named Gerhard Mazur, who was quite mm -hmm. uh, prominent, had written a good deal about the revolutions in South America and about Simon de Bolivar. And uh, we had, in my first experience with uh, systematic discrimination, <laughs> we had a men's lunch <laughs> at Sweetbriar because most of the people on the faculty were female. My department head was a woman, the dean was a woman, the president was a woman, and anywhere along the line, my, uh, the men had very few opportunities to cluster. <laughs> so we had a men's lunch on Thursday, and Gerhard Mazur presided over the men's lunch. And he looked a lot like de Gaulle, and he acted something like <laughs> de Gaulle as well. But I can always remember that the conversation was always directed. And he would say to some of us, we are now Mr. So-and-so, uh, what, what do you think about the possibilities of American foreign policy being modified in such a <laughs> way that it can deal with this issue? <laughs> and I realized that uh, what was happening in the same way that I became a junior member of the academy here at Perkins, uh, at Sweetbriar under Gerhard Mazur's tutelage, I became a, a senior member of the academy. Mm -hmm. And I've often reflected back on the the way in which his careful, patient prodding mm -hmm. uh, sharpened the sort of edges around which I uh, uh, probably had too many that were jagged <laughs> and, and rough. But uh, I've been very grateful for that. We had a wonderful time. It was a beautiful place to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, our second child was born while we were there. The girls were awfully nice to us. I can't help yeah. but tell you one story. Uh, we had a political scientist who did what faculty members are prone to do. He pontificated in class. And on one occasion he was um, talking about the poor management of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And he had uh, failed to notice on the roster there was a young woman named Saunders who had the same name as the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. <laughs> and so one day at, at Parents Weekend, <laughs> she came dragging this man over to Gilpatrick and said to him, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Gilpatrick, I think probably you'd like to meet my father. <laughs> he was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. <laughs> well, at least I learned you better be careful about what you say in certain circumstances. Uh, after four years there, we, uh, the great movement was on to uh, establish departments of religious studies in state universities. You mm -hmm. remember yes, when that was yes. a great trend and so many places that never had had religion taught right. or had had it taught informally were beginning to bring religious studies into the curriculum of mm -hmm. the university. And Oklahoma State was doing that. And I had on the ship coming back from uh, England met James Ralph Scales, who was at that time the vice president of the Oklahoma Baptist College in Shawnee, but had become dean of the uh, College of Arts and Sciences in Stillwater at Oklahoma mm -hmm. State. And Scales got in touch with me and said, you want to come out here and start a department of religion? And I uh, didn't really know whether I did or not, <laughs> but I liked him and uh, thought that might be kind of fun. And went out there and liked the place. And despite the fact that the Baptists threatened to sue us if we started the department and the Unitarians <laughs> threatened to sue us if we didn't, <laughs> we decided to go ahead. And uh, I spent nine good years at Oklahoma State. It was an interesting place to was be. Was that long? I yeah. didn't realize that. Like being at the <coughs> large state university and like mm -hmm. the things that went on, but lots of folks and good friends. It was great fun. We mm -hmm. enjoyed being there. So that was sort of what uh, 
brought us uh, 15 years altogether teaching in undergraduate mm -hmm. institutions and working with undergraduates, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I never really had any idea that I'd go back into seminary. I always mm -hmm. assumed probably I would, uh, by that time I'd become head of the uh, School of Humanistic Studies at Oklahoma State, which was philosophy and religious studies and humanities and eventually art, speech, and music. Uh, since the speech people couldn't talk to each other, they just sort of <laughs> folded them into us. <laughs> yeah. And so we had some interesting times. But I thought I probably would go on to administration and state university system mm -hmm. or uh, uh, undergraduate kind of thing. So when the call came in 76, to go back to Drew as dean of the theological school mm -hmm. and decided to make that move. It was not only a, a change of jobs, but it was a, a real change of vocation. It was a different direction yeah, for sure. me. And it was uh, something that I uh, took a while to, to get sort of adjusted into that new, new mold. I hadn't been around the seminary since I graduated. so. Well, geographically, <coughs> that it was a different part of the world, too. It was. Yes. It was. And uh, I think the times that we spent away from our roots and home uh, were mm -hmm. good for us. We spent yeah. 20 years all together away. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we came back to Dallas in 81, it was both a pleasure to get back, but also it was uh, a surprise that the place that we thought we knew so well had changed it so changed much. So and much, we yeah. also realized that we had changed a lot in yeah. that time, too. Well, you had marvelous preparation, though, through those 20 years or so for assuming the duties of dean in 1981. Well, you followed uh, Joe Quillian then as, uh, right. as dean. Can you reflect a bit on uh, what you did find when you came back? Uh, what impressed you most? <laughs> or maybe what <laughs> depressed you most? <laughs> well, certainly, one of the things that I remember the most than anybody who ever knew Joe uh, was that his his desk looked uh, a little bit like it was the permanent storage <laughs> arena for most of the archives, <laughs> junk and assorted yeah, things. Yeah, you know, that it was a standing joke in the yeah, community. I'm yeah. sure it was. <laughs> Joe's desk was just rounded over. And I remember when I came down, uh, he had to get a great pile of papers off a <laughs> chair <laughs> yeah. and so I could sit down. And he said to me, uh, well, he handed me this huge pile of papers and he said to me, I want you to read these because we're going to talk about them in the morning and they're important. So I dutifully went back to my room and, and was up half the night trying to wade through this assortment of papers which weren't really uh, sorted or anything else. Joe had just sort of gathered them up off <laughs> out of the file. Or you had to establish the relationship. I had to establish the relationship. <laughs> and the next morning, uh, he said to me in his broad Georgia accent that seemed to me always got broader the longer he stayed in Texas, you know. Yeah. He said to me, uh, well, he said, we we going down this morning and meet Charlie and Jesse James. <laughs> I said, well, who is this? <laughs> oh, well, these are nice people. you like them. So we went down to Ferris, Texas, and met this old couple and played dominoes. <laughs> and Joe never mentioned all those papers again. <laughs> so I... I'd done all of that preparation and nothing at all. But uh, Joe, of course, taught me homiletics, so I was, and then I had worked with him in the uh, Association of Theological Schools in the mm -hmm. ASDS. Yeah, yeah. He was dean. And of course, all of us who knew Joe knew that he did these uh, elaborate doodles. Yeah. Then he would do that in the in the meetings, and I used to sit next to Joe and watch him color these elaborate <laughs> things that he drew freehand. I, I have one on the wall, which always reminds me of I have a couple of them in my well, position, sure. too. Yeah. I never could figure out how he could concentrate on anything and, and do that at the same time, but he could. Well, I saw Joe yeah. one time when he usually could, as a matter yeah. of fact. kind of reminded me of judges, how they seem to be totally mm -hmm. disconnected from what's going on, then immediately focus in on yeah. the thing. But we were in a meeting one time, and uh, Joe came into the discussion, and uh, and he was 180 degrees off the thing. And as you know, when Joe started talking, it was kind of a stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get him stopped. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> Merlin Norfeld, who was president of Garrett in those days, and big a character as Joe was, just burst out and he said, damn Joe, he said, <laughs> either pay attention or color. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought about Joe <laughs> getting with it. 
<laughs> he was a great leader and, and for a long time here, my goodness. Uh, oh, he was. And 20 plus years as dean. And his impact within the whole university was substantial. And one thing that I always admired about him was his insistence that faculty people take uh, seriously their roles in the university. Yes. And uh, many among us uh, held those positions and committees in various places that, that helped to contribute to the growth of the university. Significant. Yeah. Albert yeah. Outler, of course, mm -hmm. with the uh, master plan. Right, right. John Deschner, who had a great yeah. deal to do, I'm sure, with the university college and taught it yeah. regularly. Your yeah. work as provost, all of those things. And uh, he sanctioned mm -hmm. this. I mean, he, he sure. felt that this was a part of the um, responsibility of the faculty member. And I wish that more deans felt that way, as right. a matter of fact. Well, now you were dean until uh, 95? 94. 94. I resigned as dean in uh, the fall of 93 and was to serve out that year while they had time to hire a new dean. And so I, was, I left the office uh, in 94. I was dean 13 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And then what? Well, <laughs> uh, I had... I had been given a year's leave because administrators were given that time off after administrative mm -hmm. service. You probably got the same after yours. And I hope you did. I had one semester. <laughs> one semester. <laughs> so I had uh, started the process of getting ready to be on leave and do some things. I was sitting at home. Actually, I was called on Monday afternoon. Ken Pye called me. and. Uh, when I got back to him, he'd already left the office, and so they said to be sure to call him at home. So I went home and uh, ate dinner and, and uh, had just been sort of waiting to call Ken, and I called him, and uh, he told me that he just received this diagnosis and that they really didn't think he had very long to live and that he was getting ready to resign as president of the university. and. Uh, that he would do that on Wednesday. This was a Monday night, he was gonna do it on Wednesday. And um, he told me that the trustees had already appointed a search committee and that this thing would move rapidly and then he said, I have a great favor to ask of you. And I said, oh Ken, I'll be glad to do anything I can to help. And I was thinking all the time, I don't want to be on that search committee. I just got <laughs> out of this deal, and I don't want to do that. And so when he told me that what he had in mind was that I should become the interim president of the university and serve as long as it took, uh, I was just floored. Yeah. And, uh, there goes your leave. <laughs> uh, well, there would leave and a lot of other things, plus just the questions that you have about can you do this. And uh, he said, I want to see you tomorrow. I'll come over to the house. So I went over to the house. And uh, although I knew Ken was ill, I really didn't know how, how ill he was. He really went rapidly, didn't he? He went rapidly. And I hadn't seen him in six mm -hmm. weeks, I guess. And so I was astonished by the way he was. And uh, so he outlined the things that he told me had already been taken care of. Sounded like all I had to do was to just sort of walk in and answer the phone if anybody called. Didn't exactly turn out to be that way, no. but uh, so on Wednesday we had the press conference and um, Ken resigned. And Lisa McMasters, who at that time was doing a sort of uh, PR counseling for the university and, and was working with me, said, you better be ready to answer the question because the first one you'll get is what do you expect to change in the university? <laughs> you thought a lot about it. Yes, that I point. certainly <laughs> thought a lot about it. And so I uh, replied when the question came, as Lisa said it would, that uh, they had to remember that 24 hours ago I was sitting at home reading a spy novel. <laughs> and most of the time that I saw people, they said, did you ever finish the book? <laughs> That was my only experience with a successful sound bite, but uh, Lisa had alerted me to the fact that it might come up. It was an interesting year. It gave me another perspective on the university, which I never thought I'd have. Yeah. For better or for worse, I hired Jim Copeland in that year. I got us into the WAC for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Lively and I, Bill was the acting athletic director. Yeah. Uh, Mike DeMint came during that year, yes. so it turned out to be more of a year of athletic events and decisions, and I learned more about athletics than I had ever known or thought I'd ever know. Or maybe wanted or to Or maybe know. even wanted to know. 
Well, we were we were very fortunate that you were available to step in under those very regrettable circumstances. That was a, a tragic event in the It was a tragic event, the, a moving school. event, mm -hmm. really. Kendon lived uh, six weeks or so oh, after that. That's right, <coughs> yeah. Well, then uh, you did finally get a leave, I think. Uh, after I finished the year in the president's office and Gerald Turner came, uh, I did, in fact, get leave. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that year, went back into the faculty to uh, teach church history, which that is what been, I'm doing now. 96? 95. 95. 96, that's 96. right. Fall of 96, that's mm -hmm. right. Well, in your tenure now as, uh, once again, professor of history, uh, church history, you turned out uh, three books, I think, in recent years. Uh, Since 96, yeah. 96, I had a few yeah. projects that were sort of hanging in those yeah. other years. Uh, can you tell us about those? I, 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 I know one of them very yeah. well. I, the biography of uh, Bishop William C. Martin. Yes. I've read with great care and uh, with great interest. He, of course, was my pastor during my boyhood days yes. down at First Methodist Church right. here in Dallas. And uh, he was one of the persons whom I admired most uh, throughout the remainder of his life. And I read that with, with great interest. It was a real accomplishment and a great deal of information. There. Well, you, you represent a, a portion of a very sophisticated, uh, small group of people who actually read it. <laughs> but and it was fun doing it. And uh, I, uh, he was the bishop who ordained me, as a matter of fact. Oh, is that right? And yeah. so I had, and my father, was a member of his cabinet at one time, so I had known Bishop Martin, not well, but uh, had not at least yeah. known him some. Uh, 96, Russ Ritchie and Ken Rowan, I published a history of uh, American Methodism. And then um, uh, in the fall of this year, I published a uh, history of the Episcopacy. Mm -hmm. Methodist Episcopacy. Methodist Episcopacy, mm -hmm. so those are the three that have come out. Martin yeah. came out in the fall, in the, uh, January of this year as well. Mm -hmm. So the Episcopacy and Martin came out uh, really same month. <clears throat> well, you've been pretty busy in these years since you returned to the full It's been fun teaching. to go back and, and to sort yeah. of catch up on some of those. You don't have much time, as you know, when you're doing administrative chores. Yeah, I know that very well, yes. Hide away <laughs> in the library. <laughs> well, Bishop Martin also had some uh, interesting and important connections with SMU. Could yes, you, you, you relate a few of those for us? Uh, okay. He was on the trustees for a long time, but I guess the most interesting part of Martin's uh, experience with SMU was that over a period of about five years, starting in the late 1920s and going on up until the time that he actually went to be the, uh, the minister at uh, First Church in Little Rock. Uh, he was uh, courted and accepted the job and turned it down and got courted several other times to become dean of the seminary here at SMU. Yeah. They were very anxious for him. Before it was Perkins. Yes, before it was Perkins. <laughs> mm -hmm. and he graduated here. Uh, he was an SMU grad, and they were very anxious to have him come back. But they, it never worked out. They never could get it worked out for him to come. But uh, it was always fascinating to me how diligently they worked at it. Charles Selectman was president of the university, and mm -hmm. Selectman was, I think, determined to have him. And John M. Moore, who was chairman of the Board yeah. of Trustees, was uh, actively trying mm -hmm. to get him to come. Then Martin served on the board uh, as a representative at large from the M.E. Church South. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when he came to retirement, he came back to put in what is now Perkins as the first bishop in residence right. and was here four years. That was probably during your time as well. Yes, right? it was. Yes, mm -hmm. it was. Uh, as a matter of fact, he came when I was in the provost's position. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, uh, I followed very carefully what he was what he was about. Yes, but he was such a powerful pulpit figure that yes. uh, I think it would have been probably a misuse of his skills to put him in here as dean at the time that they were courting him. Uh, but he, he was uneasy about it, and I think one of the reasons he was uneasy about it is that he was sensitive that he didn't have a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. He had a seminary degree, but he didn't have a graduate degree. Yeah. And I think he felt like that he might, in a university setting, be a second-class citizen, even though his experience, in those days, his experience was not all that conspicuous. He hadn't been no. out too long. He was young. Yeah. And, uh, he even contemplated going for a 
doctorate, didn't he? He did. Yeah. He thought about it. And uh, Paul Kern, who was dean and part of yeah. time later bishop, right. uh, sort of said, you might ought to think about whether you, whether that's a good use of your time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he did, um, while he was here as bishop in residence, teach in the School of Theology, didn't he? Yes, uh, and he a, taught part of the time while he was at First Church. Yeah. He taught homiletics. Yes, taught yeah. homiletics, homiletics or eternal church administration. Mm -hmm. but, uh, was a very remarkable man. Well, he was indeed, and uh, I'm very grateful to you for filling in a lot of the details that <laughs> I had no notion about in his <laughs> in his life. There are a lot of them. Well, you poured through his uh, his diaries and uh, other materials that are in the Bridwell. they in the Bridwell yeah. archives. Mm -hmm. That's right. He kept a diary from 1914 until he was in his 80s. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to read 60 more years of a man's life one day at a time. Imagine the diligence that is required <laughs> to, to fill that in each yeah, day. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, as you, as you look back over the university and survey it now, um, what observations do you have to make about uh, where we've come from, how we've got here, where we're going, and so on. Well, it's amazing to me because when I think about uh, what was here when I came as a freshman in 1951, living in an old hot Atkins Hall, I sure do remember that. <laughs> uh, no air conditioning, it was terrible. And uh, all of us were there together. That was true of most of the university. Yes, it was. Time. It really was. Uh, the only uh, residence halls that were present in those, Meadows was not there. No. Peyton Hall was, and Virginia and Snyder. Virginia and Snyder, yeah. But none of the freshman quad mm -hmm. was there in those days. So that down on our end of the campus at Perkins, we were pretty well uh, isolated from the rest of the university. Mm -hmm. Stadium, the old O&B Stadium was there. Yes. But there was a great uh, uh, expanse of grass <laughs> across the field there where we now have been. I guess for the obvious change is that huge increase in the number of buildings and oh my, yes. all of that. It's just astonishing, even even yet, when I think about all the things that are being being constructed, that, that is. Uh, I think there's also no question that uh, over the years we have uh, we've improved in our, our statue and in our commitment to to a higher academic standard. And uh, I, I uh, give Merriman a lot of credit for that. I think in a lot of ways Perkins, uh, because of some of the extraordinary achievements of some of the people, certainly Schubert, Ogden, yes. who, and John Deschner, both of whom were great university citizens, and mm -hmm. Victor Furnish, mm -hmm. just to name a few. Richie Hogg. Richie Hogg, that, that's right, yeah. Richie. Uh, all of those people set a standard when the university created the first distinguished professorships. You'll remember that Furnish and Ogden mm -hmm. and Bob Anderson, who was sort of one of ours as well, right, the music were, program. were three of the first seven mm -hmm. university distinguished professors. Yes. And uh, they, they created for all of us a kind of benchmark, I think, that uh, said if you don't at, at least try and if you don't keep this firmly in mind, you probably aren't doing your best. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was always a good thing for me to, to know Schubert was around. Oh, yes. Both when I was a student and when I was dean. <laughs> but, uh, it, uh, it helped. Yeah, he came here while you were still a student. He did. First time I ever saw him, Schubert was uh, 28 years old and had not uh, finished his degree at the University of Chicago. And I saw him in the cafeteria line. He was wearing white buck shoes and had a crew cut. <laughs> That would have been what, 56? I guess 56, 56 probably, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All we knew was that the book on him was that he was the brightest thing that had come out of the University of Chicago <laughs> in generations. Yeah. And I think that was probably, probably true. probably was true. Yeah. John Dester came at about that same time. He did. Or was it the same time? He right? came uh, probably a year earlier, yeah, maybe. Year earlier, yeah. Yeah. From Basel. Mm -hmm. He'd done his work in Switzerland. You'd done your work at Union. Yeah. Uh, and Van Harvey was here in those days. Yes. And Van, of course, went on to a very distinguished career at Stanford. And, uh, and then University Penn. of Pennsylvania. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. 
Well, it was great fun to be a part of that uh, fellowship in those days, yeah. and uh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the old coffee hours that we had. Those right. were those were among the most stimulating discussions that we had anywhere at the school, I suppose. And, uh, I think one of yeah. my favorite stories is one you know well when the old Luby's Cafeteria was up here on Hillcrest. And yes. Ogden and Harvey and uh, I don't remember who else, but I knew Ogden and Harvey went up and got into a discussion which escalated into an argument <laughs> over Christology <laughs> and some ruling of some obscure council. <laughs> and they were asked to leave, please, as <laughs> they were disturbing the other guests. Probably the I'd, I'd never heard that. The only time that's... anybody ever got thrown out of Luby's in a Christological <laughs> debate. <laughs> and there have been many of them. There have been many of them, that's right. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned that during your period as interim president, uh, you had to face up to a number of athletic uh, crises. You want to reflect a little bit, or dare you dare dare reflect a little <laughs> bit on the on the role of athletics in the university? That's been a, a hot topic for a long it time. It has, and I think it's one that's uh, that shifted and changed. I uh, I saw a thing the other day. I can't resist uh, saying it has nothing to do with SMU, but uh, well, it does actually. I saw a thing called football jabs, mm -hmm. and they said, why is it that the university show uh, University of Texas chose orange as its color? And the answer is because you can play in it on Saturday, you can hunt in it on Sunday and pick up trash the rest of the week. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I have always wondered if, uh, if a new day isn't coming when institutions like SMU are going to have to place the emphasis at other places. SMU has excelled so much. I remember going to an alumni group with Jim Copeland when he first came. And, um, that athletic director. Yes, Jim. and Copeland and I were off, uh, I guess, I remember it was in Fort Worth, I guess. And uh, somebody said, when is SMU going to excel in athletics? And Copeland said, we do excel in athletics. And I think right now, you know, here's our soccer team, which is at the top mm -hmm. of the national rankings. The swim team uh, uh, has always traditionally been one of the contenders in the NCAA. And, other basketball and women's sports and things of all. Tennis team has done Tennis well. Tennis team has done well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a, an outstanding program. It's just that most of the emphasis and most of the attention goes to uh, football. football. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's difficult because football is put into a situation where it has to carry the, the burden of revenue yeah. for all the other sports. And it's also unfortunate for the athletic program that uh, if you don't make it, it's sort of like if the coffee doesn't make it, neither does the meal. Yeah. And if you don't do well in football. I really seriously wonder whether institutions like SMU uh, will be able to uh, to compete in high level. At the high level. Yeah, I really wonder. That field is going to be dominated largely by the great, uh, by the big state sure. schools. Already is. And of course there are a few private schools that make it sure. big. There's Notre Dame, Stanford and right. so on. But uh, for the most part, it's going to be the big state schools. It is. And mm -hmm. the problem, when the Southwest Conference broke up, that was a very serious mm -hmm. uh, event in the life of our athletic program because uh, when we were members of that, we participated as a full participant, yes. win, lose, or draw, yeah. in the revenue stream. Right. And the institutions that were in the Southwest Conference were nearly always involved in bowl uh, mm -hmm. appearances. Yeah. and. Uh, then as, Tevany, as television came online, uh, Tevany, uh, t television is what drives all of the revenue. Oh, yes. It's yes. what drives it. And it's amazing each Saturday some of the same teams are on oh, every Saturday. Absolutely. <laughs> and I guess I ask myself, who really wants to, wants to pay a lot of money to see Rice play Tulane? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think very many people do. And right, right now we're sort of a person without a country. We are. Mm -hmm. We are. And that's mm -hmm. unfortunate. Yeah. The whack that we got into, I, my uh, own personal uh, judgment about it as I dealt with that issue uh, was the WAC didn't really want us. They had mm -hmm. more teams than they really needed. They didn't have enough revenue to share that effectively with 16 teams. So I wasn't surprised, frankly, that uh, the WAC didn't, uh, in that 16-team format, didn't yeah. last very long. Yeah. I thought probably we'd be out of that.
And you don't have natural rivalries within that uh, No, we context. lost that. Yeah, yeah. I do, like everybody else who was around in the 50s, I do remember what it was like to go to the Cotton Bowl oh, in yes. the great old days. And we can all reminisce about that and wish it were so, but uh, we do have well, a lovely new stadium in which to play. Yes, it's a beautiful stadium, and, uh, and I hope it will uh, be a venue for many interesting events in addition to football. Well, I certainly games. hope it will, yeah. and I expect yeah. it will. And, uh, I even remember back to 1936 when we won the national championship <laughs> <laughs> and went to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Those were Willis State's days. Huh? Those were Willis State's days, and... and uh, Bobby Wilson and Harry Shuford and uh, other right. people whose names are right. emblazoned on the memory of the university. Yep, exactly. Well, are there other things that you would like to um, delve into uh, before we probably close delve out? into too much? You think? Well, already. I, I, I don't think so, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you certainly have the opportunity to continue if you wish. Uh, uh, I just but. Didn't. Been good, good to be here. Really, it's SMU has a very special place for us because my mother is an SMU graduate, my yeah. father is an SMU graduate, and my wife is an SMU graduate. So uh, we uh, fairly well uh, have covered the place in the years. You're part of a big family and an important part of a well, big family, we and uh, feel glad that SMU has uh, played such an important life. Unfortunately, neither of my two sons went to SMU. Mm -hmm. We broke it off, I guess, at that point. <laughs> Maybe grandchildren will, Neil. Well, let's hope so. Continue that tradition. Continue uh, that, that tradition. tradition. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you here thank today. You. Uh, we've nice had a long you. association and a we long friendship, indeed. and uh, I regard with uh, great admiration what you've contributed to this university. Thank you, and I and you continue too. to contribute it. And, uh, we appreciate your willingness to share with us today um, the recollections of your experience here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.